The United States Space Command is one of the 11 combatant commands of the Pentagon. U.S. Space Command, usually called U.S. Spacecom, is not a military branch like the Air Force or the Space Force, but it is a joint military command that is composed of units from two or more branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. These commands conduct broad missions, but the history of U.S. Space Command is made up of new startups, failures, and it's just a little bit more complicated than we might think. Welcome to the Global Network. Please support this channel by clicking the like button. If you like our content, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to get involved, visit our website at spaceforpeace.org. Before continuing, let's just clarify that U.S. Spacecom is not the Space Force. And there are many other space commands, such as the U.S. Air Force Space Command, the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, the Naval Space Command, and even more recently, the Marine Corps Forces Space Command, also known as MAR for Space. And well, who knows how many other space commands there could be, but this is what we know for now. All combatant commands focus on a specific area of the planet. Africa Command focuses on the African continent. The Indo-Pacific Command focuses on the Indo-Pacific region. By the way, this was formerly known as the Asia-Pacific region. And the Cyber Command focuses on cyberspace operations, so on and so forth. Again, there are 11 combatant commands, each with a specific focus. Now, the U.S. Space Command was originally created in September of 1985, but it was actually disestablished in 2002. Then, it was set up again in August of 2019. So, this combatant command actually has two incarnations, but why did it dissolve in 2002? So after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, new focus was placed towards homeland defense and counterterrorism, and this resulted in outer space being less of a priority to the Pentagon. As a result, the command structure was reevaluated, eventually establishing a new combatant command at the time, U.S. Northern Command, in order to take up these new policies of homeland defense and counterterrorism, etc. As a result, U.S. Space Command duties were absorbed into the U.S. Strategic Command, otherwise known as U.S. STRATCOM. With the establishment of U.S. Space Command, we're even better. Because now we have a command with a singular focus on space superiority. Many in this hangar remember the original U.S. Space Command, right here at Peterson Air Force Base from 1985 to 2002. You know, when the Cold War ended and the threat to space diminished, we stood down the command and established U.S. NORTHCOM, focused on protecting our homeland in response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In 2002, when the command deactivated the responsibility for space transition to the United States Strategic Command, and for the past 17 years, STRATCOM was the steward of this warfighting domain. The Global Network previously made a video about U.S. STRATCOM, describing it as the world's most dangerous organization. If you're interested, just check out our channel playlist or visit the video section at our website to watch that video. Now let's take a trip down memory lane. After the Second World War, which ended in 1945, the Pentagon began to pay more attention to outer space to use as a military advantage a new realm to expand military operations. This was headed by a military branch which doesn't exist today called the Army Air Forces. This branch was the precursor to the U.S. Air Force before it was established in 1947. Later in 1954, the U.S. Air Force created its first space organization, the Western Development Division. Two years later in 1956, the U.S. Army created its first large agency focused on missions in outer space, called the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. The technical director of this agency was Werner von Braun, a former member of the Nazi SS party, who specialized in aerospace engineering and space architect. 
After World War II, he and thousands of others from Nazi Germany were brought over to the U.S. to build a space program. This project was called Operation Paperclip. Yes, you heard me right. The U.S. brought former Nazis to the U.S. to build its space program. Anyhow, by 1961, the U.S. Navy wanted a part of this action in outer space, so they developed the Naval Space Surveillance System. This organization served the primary purpose of tracking electronic signals and other methods of ground-based satellite tracking. In the 1980s, these organizations evolved. We then had the U.S. Air Force Space Command in 1982, the U.S. Naval Space Command in 1983, the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command in 1997, and recently the Marine Corps Forces Space Command in 2020. It's important to remember that in 1983, two years before the first incarnation of the U.S. Space Command, the Strategic Defense Initiative was announced by Ronald Reagan and later established in 1984. This initiative was dubbed the Star Wars Program. This initiative was aimed at missile defense systems intended to protect all attacks from ballistic nuclear weapons or intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. In actuality, it just pushed the arms race forward during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, bringing the world close to nuclear devastation. President Reagan was optimistic today about prospects for a treaty to cut U.S. and Soviet strategic offensive weapons. But once again, he said he would never give up on Star Wars. Gorbachev telling the president to give it up to avoid another arms race. The president refusing. Today in his weekly radio address from Camp David, President Reagan vowed once again not to bargain away his strategic defense initiative. We will move forward with SDI. It is our moral duty. Well, I think obviously Star Wars is the thing that's most in the news and the thing that most excites the imagination and indeed the anxieties. What do you think is going, would be the result of this whole Star Wars project? If we were so foolish as to go ahead with it, I think uh, the net result would be after the expenditure of uh, a million, million dollars, um, that uh, we would be far less safe than we are today. The president's own technical advisors make it clear that this proposed shield after 30 years of development would be exceptionally leaky, would let through enough Soviet warheads if the Soviets chose to attack the United States to uh, utterly destroy the United States and uh, perhaps to bring about nuclear winter as well. The Soviets can outfox the system, underfly it, overwhelm it. It uh, is ruinously expensive. It abrogates a, a large number of treaties that the United States has solemnly signed. Uh, and in addition, it is likely to bring about nuclear war itself if uh, the Soviets were to believe, as they say, that it is a uh, part of an American plan for a first strike. Apart from that, it's a terrific idea. <laughs> I'm saying, probably one of the most cheerful prognoses I've heard in a long time. Regardless, during all of this, the U.S. Space Command was first set up, but only to eventually terminate itself in 2002, following 9-11. But now, U.S. Spacecom is back with a vengeance, with the establishment of a new branch of the armed forces under its wing, the Space Force. This reincarnation of the Space Command was directed by the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act with the full intention of, quote, full responsibilities for space warfighting, end quote. This new Space Command is based at the Redstone Arsenal Military Base in Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville has an interesting nickname, the Pentagon of the South because so many military weapons corporations are headquartered there. Recently, in August of 2021, the U.S. Space Command reached Initial Operational Capability, or IOC. 
IOC is a state achieved when a capability is available in its minimum useful deployable form. This operational capability consists of support, training, logistics, and system interoperability with the DoD operational environment. The next step would be to reach full operational capacity, or FOC. This is when a system is delivered to a user and they have the ability to fully employ and maintain it to meet an operational need. Just this past week at the 36th Annual Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, I announced that U.S. Space Command has reached initial operational capability. But I also made larger point that our IOC declaration is merely the transition to a new phase in our goal to reach full operational capability. There are two critical points about this evolution of United States Space Command. First, we could not have established the command and reached IOC without our reserve component. And second, we will not be successful in re reaching FOC without you either. Keep in mind, U.S. Space Command has two sets of mission imperatives. First, we provide supporting functions to the Joint Force. Those are what we call our enduring no-fail missions that have been going on for over 30 years now. They include things like position navigation timing, global satellite communications, theater and global missile warning, amongst many others. Second, which is new, we have supported functions. That is, responsibilities in our area of operations that require support from the rest of the Joint Force. That is what is new and different from the old U.S. Space Command, these supported functions. All of this basically means that the U.S. Space Command has just graduated middle school, but still needs to graduate high school in order to become a full adult. Now, with the growing advancements from Russia's military and the rising economy of China, the Pentagon feels threatened and has responded with the goal of completely dominating outer space, completely denying other nations access to space. But has Russia and China really threatened the United States? Not really. For instance, both Russia and China have incorporated a no first strike nuclear attack, while the U.S. refuses to sign on. Also, the U.S. is just in a phase where its empire is in decline. The American-led global capitalist economy has been in crisis for some time now, and there doesn't seem to be a way to fix it. Indeed, the world is changing, again, from a monopolar world to a multipolar one. In response to all of this, the U.S., especially the Pentagon, is doubling down on its military infrastructure. Rather than actually try to redistribute some wealth, which seems might be the only way to fix this global crisis, the leaders of the United States and its military only want to continue to threaten the world with more advances in military operations, to perpetuate a new arms race into outer space, and to upgrade its nuclear arsenal. This has been the historical goal of the U.S. Space Command and the Pentagon. This has been another video from the Global Network. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button. And if you like our content, subscribe to support. And remember, get organized.